Well, welcome back to my very messy office. It's still quite messy. Uh, obviously not the place any of us would like to be at right now. Uh, it's been since October, I think, was last time that we got to visit with each other here in my office at home. Um, but it is the way it is, and so we're going to do the best we can with what we have. Um, the great thing about it is we still have this meeting to be able to come together and to be able to worship together as one body, no matter the fact that those pieces of those bodies may be spread out over a great distance. So, having said all that, welcome to worship. As we enter our prayer time, I would invite you to consider a serious question. What is prayer to you? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. What is prayer to us? Is prayer simply a way for us to receive that which we want? For us to be able to go to the places we want to go to? I would invite you to consider something different. Maybe prayer is not just us seeking and not just finding, but also recognizing that there is something greater than us, that God is greater than us. And that in fact, when we recognize God's greatness, we realize that there's more to prayer than just asking for things, just finding things, but instead recognizing those things in our lives that help us to be able to see God more clearly, to help us to experience God in a clearer way. I believe that's what prayer is. Prayer is not simply us just asking and even not just finding, but instead of realizing that it's God who both answers our prayers and also surrounds us with a love that allows us to feel free to ask. Today is gather we pray for those that are in need of healing and health for AJ for Alice for Ashley for Betty for Candy for Cassie for Clay for Dennis for Albert for Ellie
Kelly, for Guy and Holly, for Jessica and Jesse and Jewel and Teresa, for Jim and Joyce and Judy and Kinsley, for Mark and Michelle and Paul and Roberta, for Tricia and for Belvin. It's an opportunity for us to pray for those that are homebound, like Jackie and Margaret and Margie and Coleman and Gertie. It's a prayer and opportunity for us to pray for those who are bereaved, for the family of Margaret, for the family of George, and the family of Edith. It's an opportunity for us to pray for those who serve us in our active military, for Caden and for Ty and for all of those soldiers and families who love us enough to give of themselves. It gives us a chance to come together to pray for current world events, for our students, parents, and teachers and school staff, for for our country, for all those who suffer right now from emotional stress and depression, for us, the people of Mount Olivet, and for our pastor, me, for leaders that have been placed over us, for victims of natural disasters, for our first responders, and police officers, for our healthcare workers, our essential workers, our missionaries, our caregivers, those in prison, and those who suffer but are unnamed. You know, odd as it is for me to say this, this is a time for us to pray together. And how might you ask, might we do that when we are in different homes, in different places, and probably watching it at different times? And yet, as I said, prayer combines us together as a people only through God. And so whether we are together in the sanctuary or if we were watching this at different times or at the same time in different places or the same places god hears our prayers and so now i invite you just take a few moments to lift up your prayers whether they would be out loud or they would be silent allow this to be a time that you feel the experience of god washing over you as you lift up your concerns as you give up your praises, as you show your love for our Lord. Father God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for allowing us an opportunity to be able to pray together and yet while separate. Thank you, Father, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us and the love you have shown us. We pray this morning for all of the things that have been lifted up. We pray also, Father, for those right now that are suffering from COVID. And we pray, Father, especially, I guess, for those that are in our own community right now that are suffering. We know, Lord, though, that you're in control. And so we surrender all to you. And we do so in the perfect prayer taught to us by your son, Jesus. As we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now Well, that was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken places couldn't see there was Jesus for this man who needs amazing kind of grace for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day Oh, there was Jesus, there was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken places. Every minute, every moment, for I feel couldn't see it, there was Jesus on the mountains, in the valleys, there was Jesus in the shadows of the alley, there was Jesus in the fire, in the flood. blessing buried in the broken creases every minute every moment where I've been and where I'm going even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it there was Jesus oh there was Jesus was Jesus oh that was Jesus oh, that was Jesus Like a lamb led to the slaughter Jesus never opened his mouth From the trial to the crucifixion To the grave he was laid out 
After three days in the garden tomb, I can hear the angels sing. As a lamb came forth as a lion, and the lion became the king. You won't find him again at the weapon post, standing there so weak. He won't be nailed to a rugged cross, from his hand to his feet. There'll never be another cavalry, cause he don't have to prove one thing. The lady, the lamb, the the lion, the lion became the king. He came forth as a lamb Oh, but the day is still approaching That every eye shall see The lamb and the lion of Judah As we crown the king of kings You won't find him again at the whipping post Standing there so meek He won't be nailed to a rugged cross through his hands and through his feet There'll never be another Calvary Cause you don't have to prove one thing That the lamb became the lion The lion became the king You won't find him again at the whipping post Standing there so meek He won't be nailed to a rugged cross Through his hands and through his feet You'll never be another Calvary Cause you don't have to prove one thing The day the land became the lion The lion became the king Oh well One of the best parts of Christmas is also one of the worst parts of Christmas. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and I don't know if you've caught on yet, but I love Christmas. Christmas time is my favorite time of year. I love everything about it. I love the decorations, and I love the gifts, you know, giving and getting gifts, and I love spending time with family, and I love all the food, and I love the music, I love the snow, I love the candlelight services at my church. It's just, it's an amazing time of year, and I love that that Christmas feeling, you know what I mean? Like there's something about Christmas that just feels cozy and nice and beautiful. I I just love it. But sometimes I get really sad when Christmas is over. Like, you know, after we put down the decorations and after we've had our last Christmas party and, you know, after the song stopped playing on the radio, I just feel depressed. I feel empty. Like, oh man, I gotta wait a whole year until Christmas comes again. And I want you to know that it's okay to feel what you feel. So if you're depressed at the end of Christmas, that's okay. But sometimes our feelings can show us when something's wrong, right? Like our focus is wrong. And for me, when I feel depressed at the end of Christmas, that's a red flag to me that I have been focusing too much on the stuff of Christmas. And I haven't been focusing on what is most important this Christmas season and that is the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because see, the truth is that the lights and the and the decorations and the, the food and the, and the time spent with family, all that stuff is nice, but if you take it all away, you've got nothing left. If that's your focus, if that's the best, most important, amazing part of Christmas, is all the stuff, when the stuff goes away, it's gone. And you gotta wait a whole year for it to come back. But the thing that we're really celebrating every Christmas is the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're celebrating how God sent his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him 
will not perish but have eternal life. And if you let all the cool stuff of Christmas help you to get more and more excited about that truth, then after the lights are gone and the gifts are gone and the music is gone and the food is gone, all all the Christmas season is gone, do you know what you have left? Jesus Christ. You still have the most important, most amazing thing ever. Far from emptiness, you have the Savior of the world. The thing that we celebrate on Christmas is something that we can celebrate all the time. If you believe in Jesus, you will have eternal life. And that doesn't just start after you die. It starts here and now. Jesus wants to fill that emptiness in your life. Don't fill the emptiness with presents. Don't fill the emptiness with Christmas lights. Don't fill the emptiness with songs. Fill your life with Jesus. And if you do, you can have that Christmas feeling all year round. Because Jesus is not just our Savior at Christmas time or at Easter. He's our Savior all day, every day, no matter what we have or don't have. So my challenge to you guys today is that if you are feeling kind of down because Christmas is done, I hope that you'll remember what Christmas is all about. You can remember the birth of our Savior every single day of the year. You certainly don't have to wait until next Christmas to start thinking about God sending his son to the world to save us from our sins. And if you are depressed, if you do get sad at the end of Christmas, I hope that that will remind you to stay focused on what's most important. I'm not saying to get rid of all the Christmas stuff, although for some people they might have to in order to focus on what's most important. But I'm saying use all the stuff of Christmas to get you more and more excited about what's most important. If you're sad and depressed after Christmas, if that Christmas feeling is gone, then you might need to work on your priorities and focus less on the stuff and more on the Savior. Christmas time is great. That Christmas feeling, awesome. But we can celebrate the birth of our Savior every single day of the year. And Jesus really is worth celebrating. Our scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, and verses 21 through 22. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming, I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you during this time, I would just pray, Lord God, that each one of us feels connected to each other, more importantly to you. Allow this to be time of great worship, a great time of listening to your word, and perhaps more than anything, of us understanding that which you wish to hear. In order for that to happen, Lord God, we have to hear your words. And so I would pray, Father, that you take the words I might say and change them to be the words your people need to hear. And I would ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is the first Sunday after Epiphany, um, which means that the story is about the baptism of Jesus. This is the second of the three Epiphanies that border this liturgical season. We begin on Epiphany with the wise men who saw the star. We talked about that last week. Um, they were given this epiphany, um, a revelation about who the child really was. Not the son of a poor girl or a husband who couldn't find a room in the inn, but the Savior of the world. The first Sunday of the season and the last Sunday after Epiphany contain two revelations that also identify Jesus as God's Son. We begin with the baptism and then we end with the transfiguration, that misty mountaintop experience. What's interesting about Luke's depiction of the event is that the baptism hardly figures in at all. The verses we skip serve to usher John the Baptist off the stage in favor of Jesus, who now begins his ministry. But after John's bluster, the next thing we know is that the baptism had already taken place. We miss it. (laughs) Ain't that always the way? We come for the show. By the time we get our seats, it's already happened. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized, what happened? The baptism's over? 
You'd think that if Luke had a clue about the centuries of struggle the church had about the detailed baptism, he might have spent a little more time with it. Some of us in our church have struggled with that with ourselves, about how do we do baptism? I mean, we don't know if Jesus was immersed or sprinkled. Uh, we don't know which liturgy, liturgy that John prefers or if the vows that Jesus were made were the same as the ones that we make or not. We don't even know if John was properly credentialed or not. We don't know if Jesus was following the rules. We don't know who signed the baptism certificate. All right, I'm getting a little crazy. Oftentimes, though, in our very ordered lives, we want to know those things. But do we need to know them? Luke doesn't seem to think so. Jesus has also been baptized. That's the sum total of the description here. If Luke is saying that the mythology, methodology isn't what's important, then what is? If it doesn't matter how he was baptized, then what is the thing we should be paying attention to? Why is Jesus even there in the first place? Now, that's actually a question that has puzzled biblical scholars since the beginning of the church. John was preaching a baptism of repentance, but we know that Jesus was without sin. So why would he need to be there? What's going on here? The other interesting thing is that the next verses in Luke's third chapter are the genealogy of Jesus. Since the gospel writers never do anything for the heck of it, we have to ask, why is this list of Jesus' earthly family tree following the story of his being claimed by his heavenly father? Okay, so here's the leap I'm asking you to make with me this weekend. Jesus went to John to be baptized because he was entering into this messy world that we live in. All of us are born into a world not of our making. A world we can barely understand at the best of times. A world we cannot explain at the worst of times. A world, most of all, that, well, needs repentance. And that repentance, y'all, is not just a personal repentance. It's a corporate one. Jesus strode into the river to be buried up to the neck in the sin of the world and then to rise to the Spirit. He didn't approve of the brokenness of the world, but he embraced it. He made it his, and he carried it with him, like a chip on the shoulder, like a pack that he was carrying on his back. And y'all, he carried it all the way to the cross. And what did he say? When he embraced all that is wrong in this life, all that is less than divine, all that is less than holy. What words did he use to give meaning and understanding and explanation? He didn't say a thing. Kind of like we are. He was silent. I mean, did he want to speak? Or was the weight of the burden that he accepted so heavy that he was struck dumb? Like us, he was silent. So that he would know what we experience when we have no words to say in the face of death or worse. You know, I think all of us have been there, haven't we? Maybe you're there right now. Maybe there's something going on, maybe something with somebody else, and you want to be able to say the right words. You want to be able to define what's happening. You want to put it into context. You want to just to be able to understand all the parts of all this and how it works together. And you can't. The right words don't come. You can't talk your way out of an issue or you, you can't help somebody else by using words to talk them out of it. Jesus has accepted the burden of sin for the entire world upon his shoulders. I mean, what words could you say during a time like that? But there were words spoken at that moment, weren't there? Words that echo in the silence of our moments, even to this day. They weren't Jesus' words, or our words, or any human words. They were God's words. And they said simply, I love you. They were words of affirmation, not for deeds done or not done, not for being, just for being. I love you. My beloved, 
one who I am well pleased with. Words to hear in the midst of darkness, words to cling to in the midst of doubt. In the maelstrom of living and of dying, we hear and then by grace speak these words, and they are all that we have. I love you. So let's talk about where we are in our lives, where you are in your life. We live in a world that loves to put each other down. We love the world that tries to find meaning. And too often by meaning, what we really mean is that we're trying to find fault. When something goes wrong, we want to analyze it and figure out how did it break? Where did it go wrong? And maybe more importantly, we want to know who made it wrong. And we can try to justify that all that we want to. We can try to say that, well, by learning who made the mistake, we can help that person not to make that mistake again. And there's certainly some truth to that. By learning who said the wrong thing at the wrong time, by figuring out what went wrong in some sort of process, we can say, by understanding, we can avoid. Or we can make sure it doesn't happen again. And again, that I guess is all true. But all too often, what we're really trying to do when we try to figure out what went wrong and who to blame is simply that, to lay the blame at somebody else's feet. Maybe to make sure that people know it wasn't us that caused it to go wrong or to go bad. Or maybe even just to determine in our minds who the weakest one is. Who's the one that didn't do it right. And the problem with approaching things in that way is that we do more harm, sometimes even, than the harm caused by the original issue or error. We do this with people that are around us, and too often we do it with the people we love the most. We try to find fault. We try to fix them and correct them. And yet, that's not the example that we receive from God. The example we receive from God is one of love of one who cherishes and who sees the good that can be done. Don't get me wrong, we serve a God who has been known to punish people. And that's okay. I guess what I'm saying is, maybe we should leave it in his hands to do that. <laughs> now don't get me wrong, I'm sure that as my own kids hear my words, they may be saying, great, stop punishing us for things. And maybe we as adults would like the same thing. Stop punishing us for things. Give us a free pass. And God also shows us that when we are corrected, we can learn and we can move forward. Maybe that's the difference. If you look at how God operates, his correction is because he loves his people. He wants his people as a whole to stay on the path of righteousness, to stay on the path moving towards him. Too often when we see correction in the Bible, that correction is actually being caused because the people as a whole are being led astray. And it just has to stop. But yet at the same time, we see such great forgiveness, don't we? I mean, think about that for a second. Here Jesus is walking into the water, taking the sin of the world upon his shoulders, and then coming out of the water... And God is allowing all of this to happen, knowing what is in front of his son, in front of himself. Isn't that kind of an interesting idea? God is hurting himself, or causing or allowing harm to come to himself through his son, in order that we might receive forgiveness, in order that we might know his love. That's an incredibly different power, a different uh, direction, a different approach than what so many of us make. Now, up to now, I've talked about how we observe others and how we sometimes respond and look for fault in others. But how about ourselves? It's interesting. I've seen people on both extremes, right? Some people never blame themselves for anything. 
they pretty well think that they don't ever do anything wrong. And when they do something wrong, it's probably because it's something else that happened because somebody else did something or, or whatever. It wasn't truly their fault. I was actually talking with somebody the other day that kind of uh, struck me with this. Now, this person certainly doesn't feel this way, but something they said struck me as interesting. Um, they start off by saying that a particular event, I'm not going to go into the event, but in a particular event, they were taking full responsibility. And I'm like, well, that's good. And then a second later, they added on, but it was really their fault. <laughs> well, we do that, don't we? But there are some folks out there that do that all the time. They can't see their fault. There are others of us, though, that take way on too much fault. We believe that everything that goes wrong is our fault, our mistake. And sometimes it's even really big things, right? That we look back and we say, wow, that really bad thing happened because of something I did or something I said. And there may be times when that is true, but too often that's not the case. Most things that happen in our world, both individually, corporate, civilizations even, happen not because of what one person does or what one person doesn't do, but instead a whole string of events that permit it to happen. Even if you look at somebody like Adolf Hitler, who I think we can all agree was not the best guy in the world. And yet the fact is, is that he was able to do what he did that country did what they did, not just because of one person who was charismatic or was able to convince people or allow people to hear what they wanted to hear, but instead because an awful lot of other people either went along with it or added to it. You know, if you look at history, Adolf, history, Adolf Hitler rose not because of the fact that he was trying to sell something people didn't want, but instead, he was saying something that people wanted to believe. He was taking a country that had been beat down and broken through the events that happened after World War I. He allowed them to hear what they really wanted to hear, that they could be great again, that they could do things again that they had never done, um, never thought they could get back to. That everything that had occurred to them, their, their lack of wealth, their problems they had, were all caused by somebody else, some other evil entity. And they bought it. And so if we look at the atrocities that happened during World War II, we can't just lay it all at Adolf Hitler's feet. right? We have to lay it at the feet of everybody else that did wrong. So when you're sitting there blaming yourself for something, okay, maybe you played a part in it. But it wasn't just you. But God wants you to look at yourself, I believe, He wants you to look at yourself and forgive yourself. Because he wants you to accept his forgiveness. Now listen, there's a real big difference between us saying that we're going to forgive and then not do it. There's a real big difference of us saying they take responsibility, but it's the other person's fault. The only way we can actually find that is to find that through God. God whose love never ends, it never fails. If we're able to find that through him, then forgiveness becomes possible. Here's what ends up happening then. We end up loving ourselves, not in a sense of, wow, we're awesome, but a sense of, maybe the best word I can find is contentment. We become content in who we are because we know whose we are. We know that God, in his infinite ability and strength and awesomeness, actually loves us. And therefore, we become content in whatever situation we're in because we know, ultimately, whose family we belong to. Then in addition to that, we're able to spread that love, not through necessarily doing extravagant things, giving out lots of money, presents, whatever. And we've talked about ways that the church has done that over this past Christmas and Advent season. But as we come into Epiphany and we realize and think about who God is, we realize that one of the greatest gifts that we can give is oftentimes simply forgiveness. It's a powerful thing to know without a doubt that somebody has wronged you or wronged somebody you love, and yet you're still able to forgive them. 
I think back to a, a school building um, with a bunch of kids in there and somebody that came in and killed those kids. Y'all remember what I'm talking about? And the community that came around them and forgave and loved. Certainly, I'm not saying that we should go through life without punishment or without retribution for the things that we've done. I think that for us to heal sometimes, we need to be found guilty and we need to repent. But what I am saying, though, is, is that that job, that responsibility, that authority doesn't come through us. We don't get to judge people. Ultimately, the only thing we can do is take some of that forgiveness that has been thrown down upon us and use it to forgive others who have hurt us or wronged us. That's God's way. That's God's working. And what's amazing about that is God finds incredible and awesome ways to show us how he loves us and how he comforts us. And I want to end with a kind of a strange story that to me has made me think for the last day or two just how much God really does love us. My mom lives at home. She for the pretty much stays to herself. Just her and her beloved <laughs> dog, Peanut. Well, we lost Peanut this week. Peanut had diabetes and quite honestly was pretty old. And we lost him. My mom, as you can imagine, was torn apart. Um, her heart broke. This was as much her companion as any child could be for a mother. Um, or really, honestly, as anybody that lives with somebody else. I mean... Um, this was kind of her world. This was the person she got to talk to and have conversations with. And yes, he was a dog, but he was much more than that to her. As we were trying to make a decision about what to do next, we did make a decision uh, um, about kind of moving forward. And we called down to, um, to um, a place in Savannah to go and talk about what we're going to do with Peanut and what our next steps are going to be. Now, I picked this number, honestly, out of a random thing on my cell phone. I pulled up my cell phone, uh, plugged in some words, and it came up, and I'm like, okay, Mom, here, let's go to this place. And we called down there and said, yes, come down. Yes, we're sorry. We want to... It was funny because it was very much as if we were um, talking to a, a, about a human that had died. They were very compassionate and very kind. And we got down there um, to the place and we walked into a, they took Peanut and we walked into a little room. Again, it felt very familiar to me as a pastor. It's something that I would have done with a family who had lost a, a, a human loved one. And we sat down and we were talking about it and we decided that, you know, we're going to have Peanut cremated and, and all these things and, and what would happen and all the, the minutiae that comes, right? And again, it felt very much like going through the process for a human and my mom started talking about pets that she had had in the past and stuff like that and reminiscing about things. And I don't even remember exactly how it came up, but she mentioned the fact that that um, having lived in, in Pittsburgh and, you know, of course, um, that's where uh, my brother and I were both born at was when we lived in Pittsburgh when I was very young. Obviously, I was born, I'd be very young. But anyway... She stopped. The lady would have been talking about something. She stopped. She's like, really? Pittsburgh? We're in Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, and I mentioned that, well, when, when I was born, we lived in Oakmont. And she's like, Oakmont? And I'm like, yeah, we live. I was when I was born, we lived on 7th Street in Oakmont. And she's like, I lived and was born on 6th Street in Oakmont. My family, the rest of our family lived up on 9th Street in Oakmont. Now, y'all, Oakmont is not a big town. Oakmont is a small town. Um, I want you to think about that. This lady who 
we talked to in Savannah, Georgia, was born in the small town up north. Do you know what the odds are of us running into that person? Someone I randomly picked out of a Google search? I don't believe that those odds are possible. That was God. And for the next 20 or 30 minutes, we talked about Oakmont. Now, for most of you listening to my voice, you probably could care less about Oakmont. I personally love the place. I have such great memories there. My mom has great memories there. The lady we were talking to has great memories there. And for the next 25, 30 minutes, my mom forgot about her loss. Instead, got to experience the warmth and grace and love of God through this lady. I don't even know if she's Christian or not. I don't think God cares. Not in the sense of my mom. God will use everything, every opportunity in every place to show us his love if we would just pay attention. Well, get this. God wants us to do the same thing. Every opportunity in every place to be able to show people love. So that's what I leave you with today. Find a way to love. Find a way to accept love. Love never ends. And I don't know about you, but I want God to be able to tell me directly one day, you, my child, my beloved, I am well pleased. Amen. In a world filled with confusion and sometimes what seems to be hopelessness, we ask ourselves the question, how long can this go on? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know the answer to the one who holds the answer. And I find that reinforced in Psalms, the 18th chapter, verses 1, 2, and 3. Worship with me as I put those words into a song. trouble everywhere How long, Lord, can this go on? Many burdens now we bear There's riots in the streets And nobody seems to care How long, Lord, can this go on? sickness everywhere. How long, Lord, can this go on? People dying go in care. There's medicine and science, but what we really need is bread. How long, Lord, can this go on? Killing babies everywhere How long, Lord, can this go on? Abort your baby, you don't care This precious gift of life God's word they'll never share How long, Lord, can this go on? Now I bow my head in prayer Help me Lord, I can't go on Please keep me from the devil's snare They say that you're not real But your presence I now feel Lord, and I praise your holy name. 
salvation I want all the world to see Thank you Lord for loving me Do I give my very soul Thank you Lord for saving me And now your blood has made me whole there's no evil I'll fear Because you're always there Thank you, Lord, for loving me To you I give my very soul Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Your precious blood has made me whole. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's it for this week. I just pray that this week coming will be a fantastic week for you. Um, I would just ask you continue to keep us in your prayers as time goes through, especially Mary, um, as we go through this particular time in our life. Um, I would also say this. Try to find ways to love each other. I know we do a good job of that as a church. Try to find new ways. You know, compliment somebody on something. I've mentioned this before. Abby's the best about this. Abby, she'll walk up on somebody and she'll find something nice to say about them. Their shoes or their socks or their shirt or whatever. You know, as a people, if we would slow down a little bit and spend some more time just showing small acts of love, I really do believe we can make a difference in this world. And especially in this country that seems to want to hate each other as a national pride thing. We can do better. And I believe we will. And in all things, to God be the glory. To God be the glory.